First of all, I want to welcome everyone to our program tonight. My name is Jesse J. Holland. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Media and Public Relations here at uh, George Washington University. And I'd like to welcome you to our program tonight. Who informs the citizenry? Finding truth, trust and truth in a fractured age. This program is being put on in conjunction with the Reed College of Media at West Virginia University as part of year three of a collaboration between West Virginia University and George Washington, supported by West Virginia alum Scott Whitmire. I'm joined on screen by my co-moderator, Reed College of Media teaching associate professor, Mary Kay McFarland, who is there with her students tonight at West Virginia, and she'll help run the program for us tonight. We here at, at GW, at the SMPA, we are, our students are going to join us virtually, and they will participate as well through our Q&A box tonight. We're also joined by a great panel of experts who I will introduce shortly. And once again, students from West Virginia University and George Washington University for what I expect to be a great and informative conversation around a very important topic, not just for journalists, but for Americans as a whole. But first, let me tell you what this panel's about and how we got here. I don't think anyone would deny, especially following the COVID-19 pandemic, the January 6th insurrection, the Black Lives Matter protests, the 2020 presidential election, yesterday's gubernatorial and local elections, and the upcoming midterm elections, that we are living in an era of amplified polarization combined with rampant mis- and disinformation online. But what's still key is finding reliable, believable, and sometimes life-saving information. But who do we turn to for these truths? And where do we put our trust? How and why do communities agree or disagree on what's true? How can journalists help the larger community arrive at a shared truth in a time of public crisis? We're going to look back at the year of the pandemic and engage with our panelists tonight to explore how citizens in different communities access and share essential information. We're going to look at what happens when there's no news for those communities. And we're going to talk about what happens when those communities don't trust the news that they're getting. And honestly, the need for news is more vital than ever before. Right now in the United States, there are at least 1,800 total news deserts, communities with no local newspapers at all, and thousands more have ghost newspapers that have been so gutted that they barely cover those communities. And this is all according to America's newspapers. To help us make sense of all of this tonight, we've been joined by a great panel who will help us delve into some of these issues. We'll start with Ellen Clegg, who is a retired editorial page editor of the Boston Globe and is working on a new book titled What Works? The Future of Local News. Her work on this topic was recently highlighted in the Neiman Reports in an article, The Local News Crisis Will Be Solved One Community at a Time. Ellen, good evening. May I unmute? Good evening. Next up, we have Christine Villanueva, who is the project editor for Equally Informed, a Resolve Philly initiative that brings news and information to communities affected by the digital and information divide through a community-powered print newsletter and bilingual English and Spanish Q&A text service. Previously, she was the audience engagement editor at the Center for Public Integrity. And during the pandemic, she worked on coverage of anti-Asian hate. Christine, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Next up is Dr. Paulette Brown-Hines, who is the founder of Voice Media Ventures and an advocate for local news media. As a second generation publisher of Black Voice News in California, Paulette is transforming the half century old weekly print journal into a solutions oriented data journalism and justice fo focused digital organization. Paulette, good evening. Good evening, thank you. And last but certainly not least, 
Dr. Brian Castrucci is the president and chief executive officer of the D. Beaumont Foundation, a leading voice in health philanthropy and public health practice. Brian is an award-winning epidemiologist with 10 years of experience working in state and local health departments. In response to the pandemic, the De Beaumont Foundation partnered with the CDC Foundation and Trust for America's Health to create a the Public Health Communication Collaborative, an entity that coordinates and amplifies public health messaging on COVID-19 and increases America's confidence in guidance from the CDC and state and local public health officials. Brian, good evening. Thank you. All right, so this is how we're going to run tonight's panel. Mary Kay and I will start this off tonight with some questions for our panelists, which will let you and the audience know which way this conversation is headed. We'll pose some of our questions directly to some members of our panels, but others will ask all of our panel members to chime in. And of course, panelists, if, even if we don't direct a question at you, feel free to speak up and tell us what you think. If you have anything you want to add at any time, please don't be shy. Speak up because we want the best conversation possible for our attendees. But honestly, what we're interested more is in the questions from you and from our audience, from our students who are attending this program tonight. So we're going to open up our Q&A box to you, and we want you to put any of your questions you have for our panelists in the Q&A box, and we'll get as many of those questions answered as possible. Unfortunately, because of time limitations tonight, we might not get to everyone's question, but we're going to get to as many of those questions as we can tonight, and we'll pose those questions directly to our panelists. Remember, put your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat box, but in the Q&A box, and we'll pose it to our panelists. So to kick things off, we're going to turn to Mary Kay, who's going to have our first question for our panelists. Okay, this first question is directed at Ellen, um, and it's broad, so everybody can chime in. In a year of pandemic, how can so many diverse communities have such a different understanding of the facts about the disease, the vaccine, and testing opportunities? Thank you for that easy softball question. <laughs> um, look, I think the rollout of the vaccine uh, and, and policy on masking was chaotic. Uh, the Trump administration sent mi mixed messages. Public health officials were unprepared. Media has been hollowed out. So there's very little mainstream science coverage for a general audience. And messenger RNA is hard to understand. Different communities come with different perspectives. And we lost, and I, I, by we, I mean media, I mean politicians, I mean public health officials and doctors. We lost that opportunity early on to meet people where they are and say, what questions do you have? Certain communities have people of terrible experiences with a uh, lack of medical care with structural racism. Uh, the black community has searing memories of the unethical experiments done with syphilis and the Tuskegee Airmen, with the theft of, of the very cells of Henrietta Lacks at Johns Hopkins University. So early on, uh, we lost that opportunity that, to sit down with people and say, how, how can I answer your questions? What, you know, what are your religious, ethical, and practical concerns? And I, I want to follow that up with both Paulette and Christine, because you, you, you deal with communities of color. Right. And how did we miss or not inform those communities of how important this vaccine, or did we in the media do this and our words weren't enough or our words were not trusted? Well, I was going to say a couple of a couple of things and to add on to what, what Ellen was saying, um, you know, it's also where people get their information too, right? Who they trust for information. And uh, there was a recent uh, report done uh, by listening uh, Post Collective here in my area, Southern California, I'm in the Inland Empire, which is close to LA, I'll just say that for people near Palm Springs, but close to LA. 
Um, and it was, there was one of the questions posed, it was a kind of a, 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 they were looking at the information ecosystem and where do people get news and information? And um, the question was, you know, uh, where do you first hear news? And so um, it, just as many people said they heard it from like kind of local uh, news media sites as heard it from friends and family. And I think Instagram was, I think, third. Um, but, you know, there is where they get the information. I think that was a, you know, part of the problem. And you talk about the ghost newspapers. I live in a community that has ghost newspapers um, um, owned by the same uh, hedge fund. Um, and then you have um, um, uh, kind of howling out that, that Ellen said of, of, other, of other papers. And there was so much coming at us. Jesse, you mentioned it just in all the things that were happening um, last year um, that that when it came to the issues with the vaccine, um, there was so much mistrust, as Ellen noted, um, um, especially in the Black community. And we were, we were trying to get that information out, but it was really kind of trying to build trust um, in the community. Um, and that was a huge, you know, huge challenge. But I think part of the problem too is where people get their information from and who they trust for that news and information. Um, I have a lot of similar thoughts to both Paulette and Ellen, um, but I also think that it's really interesting when you're looking at like misinformation and disinformation um, and where people are getting their news, specifically through different texting platforms, I think. So different immigrant communities will use like WhatsApp, for example, or Telegram or even Kakao Talk. And like, you know, if you're thinking about immigrant communities, they also have different ties to different countries that are also getting there. Like you, it's not even just thinking about like our news media ecosystem, right? It's like also thinking about what, like I'm, I'm Filipino. So it's like, what does the news media ecosystem look like over there? And then where are my parents getting that news? And are they getting it through Facebook Messenger? Are they getting it through WhatsApp, Kakao Talk? And also like, when I know that there are other like news outlets that are also using and utilizing different tools um, for news distribution, outlier media being one of them. But I think like one thing that's really cool about um, the way that we sp like spread information too, is that like the way that you would write something for a text message is different than the way you'd write something for social copy, would write something for an article. And the way people read that is also different. But I think that the like news media when, when using these different channels and understanding how people use them, don't really think about, or could do a better job at thinking about how people read that information and digest that information. So I think that's something that is still kind of lacking in, in media as a whole. Well, I mean, I will tell you that old media dinosaurs like me, when we think of media, we think of television, radio, and newspapers. But that's not the media environment anymore. The media environment's so fractured. Like you said, Christine, there's all there's social media. There's uh, media like, I mean, we have to call like, we have to actually call Facebook a media company, even though they don't like to be known as a media company, but we have to call them a media company. So that brings me around to my question for you, Brian. The news media is so fractured today. In the past, people had their morning paper, their radio station, and they had the, the six o'clock and the 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock news. And they, everyone was getting news from the same places. But now it's fractured in so many different forms. What challenges do we have in the fractured nature of news when it comes to public relation information that everybody needs to have? Yeah, so like so much here, just from what the panelists have said already, um, you know, first off, it, Jesse, you're right. It's a different age. It's an age of egalitarian media, if you will, right? You used to, the, those who were purveyors of information used to have to buy their, what, their paper by the ton and their ink by the gallon. And that, like when I was, I'm 47, when I was in college, there was a dude on the quad and he had this sign up and he said, the world will end tomorrow. And we just kind of walked past it. We didn't think about it much. The problem is that dude now has 25 million Twitter followers. And he's saying the pandemic doesn't exist. And we can't do our job in public health if there is no, if there are no facts. And that is what we're really dealing with is the dissolution of fact. And when all of our journalists become pundits, who do people go to for news, right? Our whole society is based on really kind of two pillars, trust in government and trust in a free but factual media. Both of those pillars have a lot of holes in them. 
And it's not all media, right? Because because we, we talked about like the history of Tuskegee and systemic medical racism that we've seen. Those weren't new. We knew about that. We just didn't do anything, right? So we've created an environment where this kind of distrust can proliferate. You know, so everyone who's talking about vaccines all of a sudden like, well, you know, Tuskegee. And everyone's like, what? Tuskegee? What was Tuskegee? Okay. The fact that we haven't dealt with that already is the problem. And this, you know, very famous philosopher from the movie Doctor Strange always says the bill comes due. It was more dark. He says the bill comes due. COVID is 100% the bill coming due. 121 consecutive months of economic growth through the end of 2019 and the minimum wage never went up. Right, we've allowed social media. So when there is a company that is toxic, if it's poisoning your water, we regulate it. If we're poisoning, you know, your, if we're making it unsafe to drive, if there's a consumer product, we regulate it. But social media has been allowed to proliferate and a source of misinformation. Those who share media daily have some of the most you know, confused views and beliefs about COVID that the mRNA vaccine messes with your DNA, that it creates infertility. And here's the bottom line. If media, if social media is a primary source of information for you on COVID, you, are 30, you have a 32% lower vaccination rate than the general public. That means that social media has killed people. That's the bottom line. And we have a responsibility to have some level of protection for the consumer. So all of these vaccines, they went through FDA approval. They were tested, they're safe. But all this crap that people are spewing on social media, that's not tested, that's not safe. And it's defended in this veil of freedom. I think we need to help, we need to really think through what is media malpractice and what are the consequences of it? I think post pandemic, that's an important question. Now I'm gonna pick on some people because I saw Paulette, Christine and Ellen nodding their heads along while you were talking there, Brian. So which one of you wants to jump in first? Well, I'll say that I, I couldn't agree more that the uh, social media companies ha should be regulated. They have escaped being regulated as media companies. If they had to hire editors and fact checkers, they, their profit margins would be as thin as some newspapers. I was just, I was just thinking though, I, cause I heard the same kind of arguments about the vaccine. And it's so interesting to me because these are people who have been vaccinated with other vaccines. Like they're, they, they haven't questioned other things and I, it was such a politicized Right, uh, that and that was part of the part of the problem. And so you do have those people who are just like don't believe the like you know questioning doctors. Like they read something on a website. I have some of those folks in my family. Uh, you know, read something on a website. And they swear they just they know. Yes, it is going to to, um, to do something to your DNA. I mean, that's what you know you're hearing. And these are people who normally don't care what they put in their bodies. They're not questioning the Coca Cola they drink. They're not questioning you know anything that they inhale or ingest, but they're questioning the vaccine. I think part of that was, you know, because it was such a heavily politicized, you know, um, 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 in, in, in nationally and internationally. Um, I, I think it's very interesting to think about how misinformation had spread, not just by like weird right, like right wing news organizations, but also like thinking about behavior change in people when it comes to media literacy, right? Like if everybody who was on social media thought of themselves as like a single person newsroom, like the way that they would use social media would change tremendously. Like if, if literally this person who was like questioning the vaccine or saying that the pandemic doesn't exist, right? If they could like in the same way that journalists say, hey, like this information needs to be right or it could actually kill people. If they understood that that responsibility was on their shoulders given their platform, whether you have a hundred people, one person, or like a million people, like the responsibility is still the same. And so I'm wondering, like, I know this is kind of a little bit left field when it comes from like the lit media literacy, like perspective, but like what, what would it take perhaps to, to make people 
who are not necessarily journalists and who are regular people understand that what they put out into the world can now like actually kill people. And Jesse, can I, can go, I, yeah, go ahead, Brian. Is, is I just, there's one point I want to pull out because it just gives kind of equal time to both sides. So we know the disinformation, we know that where, where that's coming from. However, it was it's also equally important for journalists on the left not to jump to conclusions either. So remember the lab leak theory? Well, that was a conspiracy theory. That was something that we deplatform people for. And it was like, oh, wait a second, maybe it's real. So it's like, okay, wait a second. So all of us, left, right, center, up, down, really have to have a good handle on what a fact is. And I think we've kind of lost that a little bit. And any, you know, all the trolls were just eating that up when all of a sudden we were like, oh, maybe the lab leak theory is something we should look at. And I was like, well, wait a second. You all said it was a conspiracy. So then it says, well, then all these other conspiracies, maybe they're real. So, I mean, I just want to make sure that we're kind of even keeled on like both sides of all journalists have kind of bumbled the ball a bit in COVID. I, I'm totally not absolving like the left. No, no yeah. I, I just wanted to put that out there. And be right. before, before we go on, Mary Kay, I want to ask, because Brian said something really interesting that I want to ask our journalists on the panel. He brought up, perhaps we should have media malpractice lawsuits. Now we know, but we can't sue the social media companies because the law keeps them from being sued. Should we be going after social media users, the people who are putting the disinformation and misinformation online, since you can't go after Facebook or Twitter, should we be going after the people who are putting the disinformation online or should we continue with the idea of the cure for bad speech is just more speech? I'm a believer in, the, in that, uh, Jesse, so well put. It's um, this going after individuals for speech uh, collides with the First Amendment. First Amendment, the press, by the way, is the only uh, industry mentioned in the Constitution. It's in the First Amendment. And, um, and who, you know, so whose speech do they come after? I'm queer. Do they come after queer speech? Maybe that's happened in the past. Do they come after the left, the right? How do you categorize this? I think some of this comes back to editing and li media literacy and science literacy. I am come from a newsroom, the Boston Globe, where in the 80s, we had a standalone Sci health and science section that was well reported, staffed with editors, illustrators, photographers, reporters. And you may remember the New York Times had something similar. There were glossy magazines like Discover. Those have been hollowed out as the, the great media disruption that occurred with the internet in 2005 and is now being exacerbated by corporate greed that's gutting newsrooms everywhere. Okay. Any other thoughts before we move on? Well, the only thing I would ask Alan is, you know, if you have someone, so the, the Supreme Court has said, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. So there are limits to speech. When you're a major news network, I don't know, let's call them Coyote. And if you have Coyote in the middle of a public health pandemic, saying that vaccines aren't safe, or in the middle of a hurricane saying the hurricane's not coming, stay at home. At what point is that crossing that line into yelling fire in a crowded theater? And I don't have the answer, like I'm, I'm really, I, but this is what I'm struggling with, you know, as a public health practitioner. Uh, yes, and um, huh, coyote. That uh, <laughs> sounds like an animal. A anyway, um, so that's broadcast is is more regulated than print, and um, I don't have an answer to the question you're asking. I don't understand it, but I do feel like the best cure for bad speech is different speech, is more speech, fact-based speech. The problem is. Uh, 
is when we talk about media, we often talk about cable news, which is very segmented, both on the left and the right. And people have become super polarized as news, local news is hollowed out, but local news is less polarizing. There are lots of new studies that show this. And there's a nationalization of issues happening that's very unhealthy. I'm Mary Kay. Yep. Um, so um, switching gears just a little bit, um, Paulette, this question is directed at you. The SPJ Code of Ethics entreats journalists to boldly tell the story of the diversity and magnitude of the human experience, to seek sources whose voices we seldom hear. So in a 24-7 news cycle, what is, what is the balance of providing crucial information for communities and this mandate? And, and I'll, you know, I'll speak from, you know, we were just talking about broadcast and, and some of the um, more polarized um, um, uh, news organizations. I'll, I'll, I'll speak from the community news perspective, which are, you know, community newspapers um, proliferate, you know, um, many of our communities in California. Um, oh, gosh, we have hundreds, closer to probably 500 community newspapers that are still you know, in their uh, our news organizations, not just papers, but news organ local news organizations, community news organizations. Um, so uh, I'll talk about it from that perspective as well as from, even though we're talking diversity, um, um, I, I'll talk about it from the perspective of like a community newspaper and communities of color. Um, and because I think that's, that's a, you know, it's just a little, that's a little different. Um, so you have that mandate to provide crucial information uh, that you're, uh, mentioned and boldly telling the story of the diversity of our communities. So they're of equal importance. And even in that kind of 24 seven um, news cycle, um, it's still, you know, I think um, um, something that we need to look at both of, of equal importance. And I think the news media um, must constantly question their approach to finding and using sources um, as part of your question. Um, when we're constructing stories, uh, we have to ask ourselves whose voices are we privileging? That's something we always do. And then in, uh, in turn, who's are being silenced? Uh, are we listening to community voice? And um, if we aren't balancing the diversity of the community um, with the information um, um, that community needs, then we aren't really doing our jobs. And when I talk about diversity, I mean, I was thinking about this um, Mary Kay, that it's not just like diversity, like ethnic diversity or, uh, you know, racial diversity, but, um, you know, uh, gender, age, you know, if you find in your community that you have more seniors, for instance, versus young families uh, with small children, then the news at that community level needs to reflect that. It's really a focus on what the audience needs. Um, and just think as an example, I, I'm a caregiver now, actually during COVID, I became a caregiver for my, my mother-in-law. And I know there were some really some specific things that she needed to know to navigate through the pandemic because she's older, she has health conditions. Um, you know, and if I was a parent with small children, there may be other news that I need to, to know uh, about, you know, the reopening of schools or um, the, the vaccine, um, you know, vaccines when they're available for, 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 for children. Um, we have to understand our audience, I think is important in all of this, listen to our audience and know what's crucial information to them at the community level. Um, as a publisher of a black newspaper, um, here in my community, we had a younger, actually younger population, we had a lot of like essential workers, like essential workforce, and a lot of information they needed to know about how to stay safe working on the front lines. Um, so you really have to think through and understand, understand who your community is. I think the challenge is producing uh, quality news and information at the community level. Um, I think it's part of your question about, you know, 24 seven, a news cycle. Um, and not feel like you have to, as a news organization, kind of keep grinding out content. There was um, a nice report done by American Press Institute about how new newsrooms, I shared this with my editor, how newsrooms can do less but have more impact. Um, you know, growing your audience while producing less content and don't try to be all things to all people. You know, we're talking about the, the shifts in news and I think that kind of daily newspaper of record in a community 
is no longer, you know, our, our, our present, our future. Um, there's no more collaboration. There's producing less but with better quality and understanding the community um, as your audience is really the future of, of news. Um, Christine, did you, Christine um, actually does, uh, has a unique <laughs> um, service that is part of the Resolve Philly family there. Can you weigh in on this a little bit? Talk about how you do that. Balancing crucial 24 hour, 24 seven um, uh, news cycle. Yeah, it's really interesting because this is like the first I guess like job where the 24 hour news cycle tends to slow down for us just a little bit because we have to be so intentional and deliberate to what we're sending out through our Q&A bilingual text line and and like think about the wording of like a single sentence or paragraph and how that's mm -hmm. going to be received by people and then directly answering their questions. And so when we're thinking about news and the way that we're framing this information, we're making sure that a lot of the stuff that we're sending is also actionable information uh, especially if you're talking to uh, like some of our priority groups, for example, would be uh, like immigrants, uh, specifically Latinx communities, uh, people in unsafe and unstable housing is one of them as well. And so when you're thinking about, you know, the things that we're sending, uh, we have to, to, to make sure that this is information that they can actually use. And if we could frame, like, I could just think of a million different stories just within my Twitter feed for like the last 20 minutes about like how a lot of it isn't news we can use but if we like made sure that all most or if not all of the things that we're putting out is actual information that could benefit people's lives um and we're thinking about that as being like not not even just thinking about that as just like the gold standard um i think that a lot of the stuff uh would be framed differently and and that, that kind of intertwines a little bit too with like you know our business models obviously we have like, we're still selling ads, we're still selling subscriptions, right? And so we need eyeballs and that's the reason why we push content. But all like, I, I like to think in, in like more idealistic, I guess, like sense, yeah. One of the things that, that I've noticed is that all forms of media are now 24 seven. Uh, back in the day when I was working with the Associated Press, I would see reporters cover events at the same time I did, and they would go to lunch while I would have to go back and immediately pound out a story. But now everyone's pounding out stories immediately because we now all have to feed, in addition to the print edition, we have to feed the website, the blog, the we have to feed Twitter, we have to feed Facebook. But with all of the speed of what we're, of what we're doing now in the media, uh, what is it about the news that makes people distrust the source. And this is really for more national news than local news because very few people will say, oh, really, the, the Atlanta Braves didn't win the other night. They don't tr distrust the media when it comes to sports. They don't distrust the media sort of when it comes to weather. Nobody says that the weatherman says it's going to be sunny tomorrow, so I'm taking an umbrella. We trust the media when it comes to certain things. But when it comes to other things like COVID, like politics, we seem to have some type of distrust. And this question is for any and all of you. What's causing the distrust in the news right now? What is politicization? <laughs> Jeffrey, the answer. Like, I, I, for me, from a, from a public health perspective, the former president of the United States framed this up as a choice between lives or livelihoods. And so he took every public health professional and put us on the side of lives, which I am comfortable with. But, but of course, we are there on livelihood as well. And so I don't, I think it's all, it's this polarization, this news cycle that we're in wasn't unique to COVID, right? It, it's been happening since 2016, if not before. So this is just, again, when the bill came due. And it cost people lives, it cost businesses, it cost health officials being run out of their jobs, being assaulted, right? This is all reality. And so I, I think, you know, and even with sports, like I'm, I'm gonna agree with you that the Braves won the World Series. But on the sports page, there was a lot of conversation about the tomahawk chop, 
the name of the Braves. And that was in one venue of media. And then the other venue was saying, can you believe that we can't just have a good time at a baseball game? So this politicization is slowly infiltrating almost everything, right? And the research that we've done has shown it really does come down to two basic fundamental differences in our culture. Those who believe in individualism and those who believe in community. 76, when you're asking a group, uh, we asked this on a poll, what is more important to you, individual liberty or community health? 79% of those who were unvaccinated said individual liberty. 74% of those who were vaccinated said community health. And therein lieth the problem, is that the, it's that two nation problem. And we've, I guess, developed in some ways two media to serve each of those nations. I see you nodding, Ellen. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on you. <laughs> Hi, Kelly. Um, of course, I, I agree with this two nation assessment, Brian. I, I do wanna push back a little on something you said uh, earlier, which that every reporter is a pundit. And I have a background in mainstream media uh, and I would argue that uh, the public doesn't discern the difference between Rachel Maddow on MSNBC opining or Tucker Carlson on Fox and their local reporter who um, is going out to cover a school board meeting and they should. And I think um, some of that's been lost as newsrooms have become more digital. The distinction between opinion and reporting needs to be made more strongly. Um, again, this goes to media literacy. I, I don't think every reporter is a pundit, nor do they want to be. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll ask this question of Paulette, and actually, and Christine as well, because the history of the Black press was that they were more advocates for their communities than they were just pure journalists, pure reporters. They didn't just report. They also report and wrote columns and did exposés. Is there a difference between now and then? Should, when we look at the black press and the minority press and the specialty press, there doesn't seem to be that straight of a differentiation between the reporters and the, and the analysts. I first want to ask what is pure? Um, from, from a community engagement standpoint, because this is, this is my background and I also have traditional reporting experience as well. Um, a lot of what we're doing in community engagement within the framework of journalism is what a lot of these alt publications have been doing forever. And I, I know that we are perhaps gonna talk about objectivity a little later. Um, objectivity and talking about objectivity is one of my favorite things to do. Um, but you like the both sides isms, like that's that that doesn't bring us any closer to what is a fact and what is truth you know like if we're thinking in extremes and i think we should always think in extremes when it comes to stuff like <laughs> the pandemic and people dying but there were huge injustices that were happening at the time that these publications were um active um like lynchings are we going to do like a for and against lynchings like it sounds crazy now it sounds ridiculous now but you know i don't want to look back at our time in media like 50 years from now and say oh man like I, we should have done things differently and we were still talking about objectivity when a lot of um, journalists slash advocates, I guess you could say, um, were pushing for more progressive narratives. Yeah, no, Christine is so right, especially the question about injustice. I mean, when the Black press started, right, it, you know, was part of that was against the institution of slavery, which was legal, right? And, you know, you're not, now, like Christine said, that kind of argument, like, is for slavery, pro-slavery, and against slavery. Same with lynchings. Um, yeah, uh, I think that that um, you know, for us now, Christina made a comment about about um, actionable like news. And I, when I think of the advocacy role of the work, it was al it's it's almost um, more about here is news, and then like you can do something with this information, or you should be mm -hmm. able to do something with this information. 
And I think that's kind of the, the history of, you know, the Black press that when I think of advocacy, it's like, here is something so you can do something about this injustice, right? And I, and I, and I still think we're, we're, we're dealing with the same things now when we look at policing. I mean, there's, I mean, just, Health, health, you know, the, the, the medical community and in relation to, uh, to the black uh, community, they're doing a big project right now in California, where it's called Listening to Black Californians, and they want to really look at kind of racism and, um, and the uh, medical establishment and what, what black people have felt about the medical establishments. They're doing all kinds of, of, um, of um, uh, surveying and focus groups. Actually, it was a focus group last night about this because there's still these injustices that we need to shine a light on and we need to do something about. So it's not just, yeah, there's an injustice, but then what do we do about it? And so providing information for that to make changes, I think when we talk about advocacy, the black press, what we're really talking about. Ellen, I know that you and I had talked earlier about objectivity and I wanted to um, make sure that you got a chance to talk a little bit about um, some of the things we talked about um, with regard to reframing issues. Um, so some things, yes, there's not necessarily a clear for and against or opposite sides, but some things, the way that we look at the frame makes a difference, right? Like who we talk to, um, how we frame that issue. Um, would you share a little bit about your experience with that? Yes, well, there is, um... There's a great piece uh, written uh, a while ago by Tom Rosenthal and Bill Kovach for the American Press Institute. It's called The Lost Meaning of Objectivity. And they hearken back to the time of Walter Lippmann, who was a journalist and a pundit, columnist, uh, starting at the turn of the 20th century. And Lippmann Objectivity has been misunderstood. Lippmann defined it as realism and the search for truth. And Lippmann and uh, an editor at the New York World at the time in 1919 wrote a scathing uh, piece in the New Republic about the New York Times coverage of the Russian Revolution uh, and pointed out that it was not objective. It was um, a mix of propaganda, wishful thinking. It wasn't on the ground reporting. And Lippmann was influenced by the rise of the scientific method, which is the search for evidence. You start out with a theory or a hypothesis. You go out and you search for evidence. You write it down. through obser It's through observation, through talking to people, through weighing data. And then you make a decision as a reporter uh, if does your hypothesis hold up? And the best journalism, I think, is a the snapshot of the truth. It's constantly changing, depends on sources, whose truth. Uh, there's no such, you know, no person is ob objective, really, but that doesn't mean it's not that it's a, it's, you can have an objective method where you go out and gather empirical evidence and do deep listening. I was literally going to say that same exact quote. Um, <laughs> I was looking it up because it's also in Elements, the Elements of Journalism by, yeah, it's, it's like almost my Bible. So, so again, not a journalist, public health guy, scientist. Two plus two is not seven. And this is the challenge for me with the misinformation is there is no I, I, there is no other side of that. There is no, and now let's talk about why these vaccines aren't safe. These vaccines have gone through the process that we've established to get their safety. And so any, any journalist, let's use that term loosely, because um, I don't think it's people who are at reputable sources, but there are a lot of people who claim to be journalists who are talking about how it's unsafe and how there are all of these um, side effects that no one's telling them about and you know, thousands of people who have died. And it's easy to warp truth. And it's now becoming easier to warp facts. Uh, I will guarantee you that every single person on a long enough time horizon who took the vaccine will die. Immortality was not a side effect of this vaccine. Thanks and for that. What? <laughs> That's, Thanks for that. 
<laughs> yeah, and we keep hearing that, you know, this person took it and they died three days later. What'd they die of? Oh, they were hit by a car. Yeah, that's not, that's again, so I, I my challenge in trying to get information to people is that if someone said to me, Brian, two plus two is seven, I do not engage them in debate. I do not engage them in thoughtful conversation. I say, no, it's four. And I think that's the hard part of how we've lost facts and truth in this, in this milieu in which we are currently finding ourselves. But if, if we don't have media delivering the facts, public health cannot do its job. Because then the, you know, I'm going to say, Paulette, hey, we just had this outbreak of hepatitis A at this restaurant. And if all of a sudden we get other news sources saying, well, no, there's not really a hepatitis A outbreak, that's a problem, right? And, and that's the thing. I, I couldn't imagine if HIV AIDS broke in this media environment, because there are people who firmly believe that HIV does not cause AIDS. They are kind of put in the corner and, and we say, that's not true. Stay over there. I have no idea what that would have looked like today. And it honestly scares the bejeebus out of me. When I think it goes back to Brian, I think you were talking about like, you know, um, um, uh, or I don't know who was talking about kind of the L and the hollowing out of, of, of media, but it's it speaks to where people are getting and what they trust in information. So, you know, we're just looking through this, you know, like I said, recent report in my area. And, you know, there's a local Facebook page that has 30,000 followers and you know it's just that I love San Bernardino is one of my the cities that near where that's where I grew up and it's like I love San Bernardino but that's where people will go and the guy who's moderating it isn't a journalist he doesn't care about journalistic standards or he's just he may have heard something and he posts it on or he shares it on that Facebook page and then people share you know and they'll share so quickly before even reading sometimes and then that's how that kind of misinformation continues to travel. And that's, the, for me, that's the, you know, this super scary, scary part. And that's a perfect segue, Brian, into my next question for you. So what strategies are public health officials using to get past all of the noise to get information to people who are not watching television, who are not picking up a newspaper, who are not listening to PRI or NPR? How are y'all reaching those people? Or are you reaching those people? We're not. Like, I think that's the, like public health communication has never been particularly good. We tend to rely on our jargon. We, do, we, we couch a lot of things in different language that makes it hard for folks to quote us in newspapers because there are 90,000 nuances. And many of us aren't comfortable in the nuance, right? And so we have to get better at this. The, the only antidote to misinformation is trust and credibility. And so public health officials need to be engaging their communities the same way that those spreading disinformation are engaging their communities. We need to be doing the Facebook lives. We need to be doing the, the Instagram lives. We need every single U.S. citizen to know who their local health department official is. And that's hard for us because that's not necessarily the job, but the job has indelibly changed between the start of the pandemic and now. It's never going to be, and it shouldn't be, a partisan job, but it is a political job. And I remember when I was coming up in uh, public health, we did this really cool thing, and I said to my PIO, we should do a press release. And he went, no. If we tell them we've done something, they'll ask questions and then find out other things that we've done that we don't want them to. And I was like, well, that's kind of crazy. Um, that's not how we need to engage media. We need to engage media proactively as a partnership. And I don't think, a, I, I think we are working on that in the Public Health Communications Collaborative in other places we need to make sure that you know public health and media public health and business public health and faith community public health and communities of color that those are resilient relationships that we build not at times of crisis but at times of rest and that's the work between now and the next pandemic because the next pandemic's gonna come and 
it wasn't like COVID's mortality rate is not inconsequential, but it's low. And we couldn't keep toilet paper on the shelves. Now replay this whole thing at a 5% mortality or a 10% mortality or a 15% mortality. You know, this has been a pressure test that we have failed. And we need to reflect on that and figure out how, when it happens again, we won't be in the same situation. And of course, just for fun, let's mention, there's a huge salmonella outbreak happening right now. And that's not even been on the front page, right? And so that's a really dangerous thing. And, and this is the, we need better relationships and it's, gonna, it's a new skill for public health that we have to get better at. Um, Go ahead, Mary Kay. Right, so we're gonna actually turn to some of the submitted questions at this point. And um, the first one we wanna ask you all is, can you shed any light on the level of media distrust as it breaks out among rural Americans versus those who live in major cities? Well, I'm from Minnesota. Um, I am from Minneapolis, which is an urban area, but I've been doing a lot of reporting in rural Iowa. I was just there in July talking to Art Cullen, editor of the Storm Lake Times in Storm Lake, Iowa. And I talked to uh, Lorena Lopez, who's editor of La Prensa uh, in, near, in nearby Denison, Iowa. And the pro problems of rural newspapers are more dire. The Storm Lake Times is never gonna have what the, subscri the digital subscriptions that the New York Times has. Um, so the remedies will be necessarily different. I am, um, if I were still writing editorials, I would write one in favor of the Journalism Competition and Preservation Act. Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota is one of the sponsors. It allows for, um, it's still a proposal, it allows for a, um, a safe harbor period where uh, newspaper publishers can negotiate uh, strategies around Google and Facebook to uh, build advertising to to try to find a sustainable business model. For our journalists here tonight, who should take on the responsibility of calling out people for their misunderstanding of fake news, especially if that news they're getting from social media is all they know as the truth? Whose job is it to go out there and tell them, by the way, your Uncle Bob on Facebook is wrong? What do you think, Christine? Is it our job? Is, is it the job of the media to go out there and do that? I don't think it's solely just our job. I think that this all, when it comes to media literacy, because that's essentially what we're getting at, right? Media literacy. I think that, like, even the way that newsrooms operate largely, like, it's funny because newsrooms internally function as silos and then like newsrooms like externally also function as silos instead of thinking of like what is and, and this is changing a lot when we're thinking about engagement but like there's a huge information ecosystem and like if we're just figuring out how to map that out how are people going to even think about information like information systems as systems right like when people like and this is true of like any system even the medical system right people people are just like I go to the hospital or I go to see my doctor they don't think about like like medicine as a system hospitals as hospital systems like all of that is just true I think that when we're thinking about systems it's going to take a lot of integration through a bunch of different sectors when we're talking about media literacy I have no idea what that even looks like because we're literally building it out right now in Philly um, but I do think that it it will take more demystifying what journalism and the process looks like and getting more participatory journalism from people who are community folks um, through engagement strategies and collaboration. Yeah, and I think there's a place where, you know, individuals and community have to be kind of, you know, held uh, accountable to 
to, you know, how they're, what they're consuming and how they're vetting what they're consuming. Um, because so much of, you know, of, of, of news also, we, there's what we see on the surface, but then, you know, Christine mentioned like, what's that? People getting information from like these closed systems that you don't even see. So you can't hold the media you know, kind of accountable for things you can't even see. I, I, I like to, re, I like to look at my next door. I like to look at my next door app just, just because I want to know what my neighbors are thinking, you know, and that is where a lot of like mi misinformation is shared and spread and believed. Um, and that's not something that, you know, as media that I would normally see if it wasn't in my neighborhood. Um, so I think there was, has to be some accountability to people and communities to make sure that we're demanding better information, but that we're also vetting the information that we're that we're uh, consuming and sharing. So, someone and also, I think people are increasingly in information isolation. My friends all vote for my candidate. I'm vaccinated. My friends are vaccinated. Now, flip that. I'm unvaccinated. My friends are unvaccinated. Here is a statistic from a morning consult poll that we recently did that will curl your toes. If you get your information from newspaper or TV, traditional media sources, the vaccination rate is 55.6%, pretty decent. If you get your primary source of information from family and friends, 28.2% are fully vaccinated. So media now has to kind of break through. And there was this wonderful interactive GIF I found on, on uh, the web once that really talked about how Americans used to have much more diverse social networks. We discussed, we debated. It was more of a cauldron of conversation. And now it is tribalism. And when you are in a tribal state, you don't necessarily want to hear other tribes and what they're saying. And you don't want to hear the newspaper reporter who disagrees with your worldview. You want to find the person who agrees and reinforces your worldview. And so how media has been kind of swept up and weaponized in our cultural movement into tribes is part of the challenge we're having. So it's, it's not, I agree, it's not like we can't necessarily blame media for this. It is a broader cultural trend that is challenging. But if you get your information from friends and family, 28% are fully vaccinated. That, that's not good. Um, I want to actually um, call attention to something that Christine put in the chat, which I don't think everybody can see. So um, Christine, you were responding to misinformation in rural communities, distrust in rural communities. Can you talk about how the digital divide um, and specifically internet access is a factor in that? Yeah, for sure. So I think when we're thinking about people who are, whether or not they're getting information 24 hour news cycle, a lot of that like hinges on whether or not there is internet access. And I think that people, when it comes to the digital divide, people think immediately of rural communities, but here in Philly, we have one of the worst urban connectivity rates in the country. Uh, there's, that's also true of Washington DC. And also um, I had a student that I taught at um, the graduate school in New York um, who was working on West Virginia and having like connectivity issues there. And, and, it, and it, it's, it's interesting because I, I think that when you're thinking, when you're thinking about like who is being siloed, um, digital access is a huge thing. And it, and it, 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 it's been seen a lot more with education and all of that with the pandemic, but it's also a larger question of infrastructure, uh, of budget, of like, uh, you know, community engagement and getting people to, to invest in communities that have been like traditionally um, ignored in both urban and rural areas. So I think, I think if you're looking at it from like a digital access lens, there's a lot more in common with urban areas and rural areas and there is differences. And Christine, before we go to the next question, I'm gonna poke at your answer here a little bit because as we know, if we keep hearing everyone has a cell phone and there are free libraries that compute at feed computers at libraries, and there's internet access at Starbucks. So is there really a still a digital divide with 
all of these things we have out there. Now, just be clear, this is a sarcastic question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I like, let's. Hear, I want to hear your answer here. If we if we want to talk about this during the pandemic, okay, libraries here. I don't even. I can't even think off the top of my head which libraries are open in Philly, because it, it 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 varies a lot. Um, access to those libraries, you might not even have a library in your neighborhood. Transportation might be so incredibly horrible that it will take you an hour to get to a library just to, to, to use a computer to apply for a job or mm -hmm. to like read a newsletter, <laughs> you know what I mean? Let, let alone be able to afford a subscription for a news publication. Um, so when it, when it comes to that, I think again, like it, it comes at an intersection of a, a bunch of different things. And even when you do have internet, it's not, um, it's not always reliable as well. And that's why I always say reliable internet access because here in Philly, the home of Comcast, like my internet still goes out <laughs> like all the time. So it, it's worse for, for communities that have been, uh, that experience like divestment. We've been getting so many great questions in our Q and A, but some of them are dealing with some of the same topics. So I'm gonna combine a few questions here and put this to the entire panel since we've sort of talked about this already. So how do you define a fact? How do you define what a fact is? And should live fact checking, should, be, should that be a mandatory, mandatory part of broadcast news shows? Would that be considered censorship? I'll start with you, Ellen. Well, as I think it was John Adams, who the second president, who said facts are stubborn things. And um, I mean, I'm, I, I was trained as a science writer. And um, so I don't, I'm not a scientist, but I would interview scientists and ask over and over and over until certain fact patterns became apparent. And I think a fact is you, you have to differentiate it in the context of lies. And if a lie is that John F. Kennedy Jr. faked his death, that he was going to reappear at Dealey Plaza, uh, I think yesterday, and, and run as Trump's vice president in 2024. If that's that's a lie. And if somebody goes on broadcast TV or on cable and repeats that Q conspiracy theory, I think uh, it's important to fact check it live. Anybody else agree? Oh, well, actually, let's turn to our medical uh, expert here, Brian. I think it just we just don't have agreement on what those facts are. You know, in, in the words, again, who's doing the fact checking where, right? So who are the neutral parties who can be on both networks and be the same? Because if you watch, you can watch an event and then go to different, you know, broadcast, you know, cable news mostly and hear like two totally different kind of perspectives on that event. And so a lie, a fact, this is the hard part, right? When you have political leaders saying, I wouldn't take the vaccine, it's not safe. When you have religious leaders saying, the vaccine is unsafe and please don't take it. And if you do, it's you know, a violation of our religious doctrine. You know, Media is not alone in trying to, to, to win the war of facts. And it used to be the place that we could go and understand facts, but now it's just there are so many competing perspectives. I'm not sure that that would actually get us to in a cable news, social media world. I don't know that that would get us what we need. And, and I'm more for regulation of the social media companies. We don't let children get toys that could possibly choke them. We shouldn't let people spread disinformation that we whoever we is, know to be patently false. Like the vaccines are unsafe. That is untrue. And here's the science to back it up. And yes, my 100 studies beat your one not peer reviewed study that you found on the web. And that's, you know, part of our challenge. 
Paulette, isn't that censorship? Oh, wow, Jesse. Now you're calling me a censor. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. You said we were all going to die. So, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> I'll stop with that. No, it's not. No, I, I, I think, I think what, what, what Brian's saying, though, about, you know, the stakes then on this, because we're talking, you know, especially now with COVID, you're talking life or death, right? How many people died because they believed something that was false? Um, so I don't think censorship. I, I, I just wanted to comment on on the the, the um, um, how you know the kind of how high the stakes are um, when it comes to the, the spread of lies instead of believing in the truth. Well, and I also want to draw a differentiation between. Should there be vaccine mandates for employers over 100 employees? That's an opinion. The vaccines are safe. That is a fact, mm -hmm. right? And so I don't think this is about pushing dogma. You know, we should have vaccine mandates. We should have this. We should have that. Every child should get a vaccine no matter what. Now, I may believe that, right? But those are, those are political choices. But the safety of the vaccine the presence of COVID, the severity of COVID. These are not opinions. These are facts. And, and, and I was people have been allowed to, yeah. No, I was just gonna say, I'm just what I was, you know, I was thinking about just even people who, who say that, that COVID doesn't kill, you know, like, like you know, that it's not, uh, like it's not a disease. I mean, you have that level of lies, you know, that you're dealing with. Um, it's not just opinion, like you're saying, or, you know, when it comes to the vaccines, um, um, efficacy, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's basic, the basic information I think we're, that we're not, that we're, that we're not even, um, that we're, that sh that's being shared that are lies, that's the problem. Can I shift gears just, um, we are talking to two uh, schools of journalists or up upcoming journalists and so um, some of them are asking about what your advice is going forward for people wanting to, to pursue this profession in this age where trust is an issue. Can I just, I can, I can just say, you know, and, and I don't know if Ellen mentioned this, but I mean, there's a, there's levels of trust. And I think at the local news level, I think people trust more, you know, um, you know, community news level. I think there's some great innovations that are happening in this space, um, you know, that to me is an exciting time to be in media. Um, some of the, uh, I'm just thinking of things like the, the markup, like there's just really, you know, outlier, I think uh, uh, Christine mentioned really cool media companies that are being created. We actually work with the, the uh, Center for Community Media here. Uh, yeah, they're in New York, but we have a project in California where we call it the Creators Lab. And we have uh, about 15 people right now going through our, our, our first class. And these are people who recognize the need for media in their community, local media, news media in their community. And you know, one, one person is working specifically on education um, you know, you have another one who's in, in, in Long Beach and he's really interested in kind of business and econ uh, economics and economy, uh, specifically for the black community in Long Beach. But there's, um, you know, people there, just, to me, it's a great, a great time to go into media. Um, it's not just that people mistrust uh, media, but there's a, a lot of trust at different levels. Um, and then there's just like a lot of great innovation that's happening. Yes, I, I, I want to. Thank you, Paulette. Our, you know, the title of our book is What Works, and we are finding uh, success stories popping up all over different business models, um, very exciting ones. The ones Paulette mentioned, what Christine is doing is pretty awesome. And, you know, I've just interviewed uh, Wendy C. Thomas, who started the um, uh, MLK 50 justice through journalism in Memphis. And it's taken on a life of its own. Uh, she's done award-winning reporting. She hired a managing editor. Um, it's all about social justice and income equity, racial equities in and uh, issues of, in Memphis. And so there's some very exciting places to gain a foothold and um, 
Journalism's a calling. Storytelling is an impulse as old as human history, and uh, it's not going to go away. I'm going to aim this question at our three journalists uh, on our panel tonight, but Brian, feel free to jump in if you want to on this one. But how do you see journalists who come from unique ethnic, racial, and socioeconomic backgrounds balance their personal beliefs and sympathies with the principles of fair coverage and objectivity? Uh, what do you see as fair coverage in this new age of media? I think this question is so funny. Some, um, I mean, talking about objectivity is very funny to me. Um, I think, uh, I, I think in, in like, I guess through my, my, out oh, because I am talking with through my own perspectives, I'm going to, I guess, like bring up the Atlanta shooting as like a really good example of journalists grappling with this exact question. Um, there are Asian journalists who are not allowed in their newsrooms to report on this happening because they felt like they were too close to it. But in the, in the, at the very same time, they will turn to Asian journalists to ask them, how do you pronounce this name? This is a double standard. What, where, where is the line being drawn? Uh, I think that experience and, and, and empathy enriches reporting. And I think that, again, you could have objective methods. You can't have, you, you as a person, whether you're a person of color or not, any person is not going to be objective. We are not journalism robots. Who you choose to speak to, the words that you use, everything is going to color anything that you report. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I think that it's, it's, it's understanding how your experience, like, helps you connect with the people that you're reporting, that you're reporting for and with. Yeah, and I just, I, to, I, to, I totally agree. And I think also that, you know, we just talked about kind of engaged journalism and like being connected to the community. I mean, I think you also, when you're part of that community, may get a different story um, than someone who isn't a part of the community. And I would, it's funny, I, I, I think I was sharing with Mary Kay when we were talking about this panel that um, we had a, a, a African-American woman who worked for one of our uh, local agencies, a water agency who felt she was being discriminated against and came to us because um, she felt that, you know, she wasn't really um, being heard at, uh, at, at work. And she was really more concerned about um, her, her job because of the, um, the makeup of the board. And there's some kind of corruption that was happening as well and came to us. And so we just started doing um, some investigation um, and there, were, there was um, um, an incident that had happened. And because we were in the community uh, we saw the, um, we actually saw the incident and the person who was the chair of that board uh, tried to make it seem like that incident was an official uh, and, and, and actually charged the, the, the water district for this party when it was really a political, a political um, event. Um, because we're in the community, we saw that, right? We saw, it, it, and so when he's in the boardroom, we're questioning him on that. Um, and what was interesting is we was all we found all because of that started digging in found all kinds of corruption, and so the the daily paper the kind of uh, hedge fund owned paper um, was, couldn't understand how we were getting information like they're looking at they're going they're watching the same meetings they're reading you know the same reports and they're like how are they getting this information so we had done a few of. Uh, 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 FOI uh, um, requests. So they did a request on our request to see if they could figure out what we were doing <laughs> differently. And, and really the thing was, we were just, we were part of the community. So you're kind of getting a different story as well. Um, I don't think it, as a negative, you can still be objective, right? We're still looking at, you know, the information objectively, but because we're a part of that community, we actually saw something completely different. Um, so I think it's, it's it, at least when it comes to like, you know, Black media, I see the same thing with, with some of the other media and communities of color. Um, there's a benefit to being a, a, a part of the community. Um, here's a question from the audience. There's often a struggle to change people's minds after they've been exposed to misinformation, especially about the vaccine. 
How can the news appeal to these people without seemingly discrediting the sources they get their news from and pushing them away from true information? You know, I, I hope that journalists can continue to, to bring light to people who have had, you know, long COVID. Those folks who said, I almost died. And now, you know, I, I really wish I had taken the vaccine. I read something today about the orphans of the pandemic, right? Um, children who've lost one or both parents to COVID. And I think at some point, I'm going to I'm going to believe this. Everybody don't laugh at me. I do believe at some point humanity will trump partisanship. And so I think bringing those human stories that if it doesn't change someone's mind at least stands as a monument to a different perspective. I think that's the importance of journalism now even in this world of misinformation, you know, be be the information, be the storyteller that we need, which is not necessarily falling into these traps that the trolls are laying, but do the best journalism of how many people in this community you know, died of COVID versus this community. And what was the main difference? It could be income, it could be race, it could be religion, but you know, do what you all do best, which is tell our stories and tell them as truthfully and apolitically as you can, so that hopefully some of those friends and family who they're listening to can say, hey, I read this great story about the, the orphans of COVID, you should you take a look, right? All we can do is lay the information out. You know, it's the, we can bring a horse to water, but we can't make him drink. Your job is to make sure that's the damn best water there has ever been. But I'll jump in right behind you, Brian, to say one of the things that we've learned about the American watching, listening, and reading public is that they're really going to believe the first thing they see, not the best thing they see. They believe the first thing that they see, which is usually ends up being on social media. So for our journalists, how do we combat the fact that People are believing the first thing they see. They don't see the correction or the fact that we say later, hey, we fact checked that thing you saw and it's completely wrong, but they'll still believe it. And one of the things that we preach to our journalism students is that we have to be sure that we're right because they'll put the story on page one, the correction on page three, and nobody sees it when you correct it. So how do we combat the idea that the American reading, viewing, and watching public believe the first thing they see and not the best thing they see. Um, I feel like this is a chicken and an egg kind of uh, problem, mainly because I, I think that people are so used to the fast paced 24 hour news cycle that that's what they expect from us. But then it's like, do we talk more and make everything faster? Um, having also had breaking news experience, um, ideally we would say, yeah, we, uh, we wanna put the most accurate stuff out there and, and you can't unring a bell, and that's all the things that we learn in school in the industry, uh, that's not always the case, you know? And, and we, we measure impact by like, oh, we beat the post for a push alert by like three seconds. You know, like, again, I think that this is gonna hit a lot of different things when it comes to culture change, when it comes to how we treat breaking news um, and breaking news and getting eyeballs and everything. It's, it's all selling ads, it's all selling subscriptions, finding better ways to fund the news and to make it sustainable, to make it more participatory and engaged and making sure that information is actionable. Like these are all things that like, we're starting to see lots of really, really cool projects all over the country kind of like doing these things. But when it comes to like mainstream news media, that's, that's still something to be seen or it's seen in pockets. And I, and I think, Jesse, too, the question there is also like you're, the first thing you see, it may not be a, a legitimate news source, right, which is part of the problem. Like we can't control that um, and until we change our behaviors because um, we'll see it, share it before we even read it, but we're not vetting where it came from. And I, think that I don't know how we can, as media, even solve that problem until the behaviors of 
people change. I mean, maybe it's pessimistic thinking, but yeah, it's just. Um, it's chicken and an egg, like yeah. who starts doing what first? Right, right. And I, one thing I learned um, from Marty Baron, actually, who was my boss before he went to the Washington Post, um, is sometimes it helps to slow your role and um, slow those Twitter thumbs down. And it just, especially in dealing with, uh, you, sometimes you wanna go for impact and depth and not be first, but you wanna find out, you wanna dig deeper. The Catholic Church story was a, a prime example of this, but sometimes there would be a hot story and uh, particularly with a t some kind of really tr troublesome image uh, that a photographer would have taken, we would actually get up and um, move to a conference room and talk through the issues at play. And uh, why are we running this? What questions are unanswered? Uh, who's the audience? And how do we have get to the truth and have impact? Well, we've talked about a bunch of depressing and not so happy things tonight. So let me turn the corner a little bit here and let's talk a little bit about how we do this thing better. So Brian, how, what's, what, what should public health officials, given the experience we've had now with the COVID-19 pandemic, what should public health officials do better if Hopefully we never have to go through this again, but if we do go through this again, and for our journalists, how do we as journalists do this better next time? I'll start with you, Brian, first. I think it's building resiliency. I think it's building relationships. I mean, there's a difference between investigative reporting and factual reporting, and the health official needs to have good relationships with the media in their area so that when there is information, they are, uh, trusted source. I mean, people who asked, you know, what do we do as upcoming journalists? I hope you go meet your health official, right? And, and try to get a relationship with that PIO. So you have the information, the facts, the science, right? That's who that's coming from. And, you know, public health needs to be out there. It has to be really visible and really engaged. And that's something we're going to have to struggle with because, the next, and again, there's already the next thing, right? We already have the salmonella outbreak. There's always going to be a thing in, in public health. And we have to be a resource to media. We have to be a resource to the community. And if you've not, if you're only meeting with the community of, at times of crisis, if you're only engaging the media at times of crisis, then that's how the relationship is framed, right? You have to be a, a member of the communities that you serve. You have to be an ally to the media. And if I can't answer it, that's why I like what I do in philanthropy because I can talk to media. But if I can't answer it, I, I should be able to say, I can't answer this, but maybe you should go talk to so-and-so who can, right? And that's the art of doing the job politically because every governmental public health official is an appointee, um, but still being truthful with the public. Ellen, Christine, Paulette, how do we do our job from our side better? I'll just build on what, what Brian said, you know, um, the, the relationships are really important in having this kind of strong ties, um, I think between uh, media and trusted uh, information providers or sources. And not just, I think for us, media is not just those government officials or public officials, but then who are the key trusted voices in a community that could help build a story, right? And people who were, for us, it was like a lot of CBOs, a lot of people in community-based organizations who were really connected with their, with their communities and trusted by their communities. And luckily coming out of the census, we had already started to really build those relationships with our community media. So we had like a media table in our region and it had already started meeting because of the census. So we just started, you know, convening around um, COVID um, and then around vaccines. But what was important was lifting up the voices and amplifying the work of the CBOs that people really trusted in the community. So it was important for the community media and the community-based organizations to have um, some kind of connective connectivity and relationship. And then the government officials, like, you know, were, were, were definitely a part of that um, 
uh, engagement. And so that's, I think, something that we've taken um, um, uh, you know, a look at and said, this is something we need to use and build this for the future. It's not like you said, it's not just when it's in times of crisis, right? So we're still meeting, we're still, you know, we, whatever the, the, the next topic is. And then it's also, what, what does the community want to hear about? You know, so we're making sure that we're continuing to have those conversations. So media is at the center, along with our CBOs, and then our, our um, either elected officials or our key kind of government officials. Um, I really want to build off of what you said, Paulette, um, on the connectivity. And um, I don't want this to be um, a plug for our program, but it's going to be a plug for our program. But we have a community ambassadorship program that leads efforts for reporting for both our newsroom collaborative and also for our print newsletter. They're called Info Hub Captains. And I think that like, this is just a start. I, I don't know what it's gonna look like in the next year or two or how it's gonna grow or or how people are gonna participate. But I do think that like, there's something to be said about crowd powered participatory journalism and building trust. Because if you're not gonna trust me, a journalist, you're gonna trust your neighbor. And if I can establish that trust with that person um, or that organization that helps you get food or do a thing um, that's really great and helpful for you, then like that brings us one step closer to establishing the trust that we need in order to be uh, an entity that people look towards for reliable information. Um, and that's something that we're trying to build right now. Um, and, but there are other places that are doing that and doing that very well. Like um, immediately the inspiration where I got that from was documenters in Chicago. And I think that's super cool where people, well, it started off like where folks were live tweeting things from um, like city hall and like these different kinds of meetings that reporters couldn't go to because newsrooms are so short staffed. And it's like, how, you're equipping people with knowledge, right? Like that's what Daryl Holiday says all the time. He's like, don't just engage, equip. And I think that that's a really key thing uh, when you're trying to build trust with communities. Um, you're telling them how the sausage is made. This is like no longer going to be a secret. Um, and we're, you're shifting the power dynamics from newsrooms to communities. Anything to add to that, Ella? Well, I think uh, I, I can't add to what's so eloquently been said, but part of our social compact should be support for community journalism. Well, unfortunately, it looks like we're running out of time, but I want to make sure I give an opportunity for all of our panelists to give us final thoughts or closing statements or add in anything that we might not have been able to add tonight. So I'll start once again with you, Brian. So we've talked about a lot of the negative about media, but Ed Young at The Atlantic has done wonderful reporting on public health. Lauren Weber from Kaiser Health News has done reporting that literally no one else is doing. She was chronicling all the states that had passed legislation that restricted public health authority. There are now somewhat like 30 states that have passed some legislation. Um, there's a lot of phenomenally good reporting out there. And unfortunately, we focus on the misinformation and the disinformation and, you know, people who we look at and think, gee, I wish they weren't saying those things. Um, but ultimately, we don't function as a society without journalists, without someone telling our story, without someone holding government accountable. And that's what you do. And that's what you're training to do. And I, I hope, you know, hopefully what becomes a small blip in the story of our nation is not something that would dissuade you from the incredible work I know that each and every one of you are going to do and get to know your local health official. All that? I just want to say what I said earlier that this, to me, it's a great time to be in this business. Um, like I said, there's a lot of innovation, cool news organizations that are that are developing and it's just it's a great time you have if you have the passion or the Ellen said the calling you feel the calling for, for journalism but also um the um entrepreneur entrepreneurial vision um there's there is there is room and opportunity and need Christine yeah I put some of my tips in the chat but um one, one is just to get a breadth of experience, right? Like, because if you wanna show up for communities, you wanna come up with the most 
like a wide range of skills and skill sets. So, you know, print radio, broadcast, crowdsourced reporting, digital strategy, social media, read about things that are going on in the industry and like the innovations and like the very exciting things that are that are happening right now with collaborative and engagement journalism. But I also think you uh, two things that are super duper important is to learn how to actively listen. And that means like being 100% present when that with that person that you're talking to um, and being able to sympathize and empathize with the things that they're saying. Um, and also don't be afraid to admit that you don't know something. I think that has taken me so far in my career, um, asking for clarity, um, admitting that like, hey, like I could actually use a little bit of guidance on this, even when you when you are doing reporting um, like can, can you explain in your own words what this is? It's gonna be so much more accurate and closer to the truth than like your perception of like a thing if you're talking to somebody who's lived experiences we should be valuing. And Ellen. Bring a pencil in the rain. <laughs> Ball, ballpoint pens don't work in the rain. Anyway, no, it's, uh, I wanna echo what Christine said and deep listening um, and connection with people is more important than any degree or any uh, book learning you get in journalism school. That's important too, but the best reporters are those who quiet themselves and have an open notebook and open mind and deeply listen. Mary Kay, I wanna turn over the mic to see if there's anything you wanna say before we close. Uh, I just wanna thank everyone for being here. This has been really informative. Um, and um, have a good evening. I want to make sure we thank our wonderful panel, Dr. Brian Castrucci, Dr. Paulette Brown-Hines, Christine Villanueva, and Ellen Clegg for spending time with us tonight. Panelists, thank you so much. I'd also like to ask our panelists if, if you want to engage with our students further, if you could please put your email address or contact information in the chat where our students can get in contact with you if you want to engage with them further. Before we close, I want to make sure that we thank the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University and the Reed College of Media for helping us put this panel on tonight. And a special thank you goes out to West Virginia alum Scott Widmeyer, who is who brought this collaboration between West Virginia and George Washington together in the first place. Once again, my name is Jesse Holland. I've been joined by Mary Kay McFarland, and this has been a great panel. Thank you, everyone, for being with us tonight, and we'll see you next time. Once again, thank you, panelists. Thank and you so much. Have a great night. Have a great night, y'all.